Hi, in this lesson, I'm going to discuss the Edexcel Unit 1 paper, January 2019. Okay, so the first question, which of the following is a vector quantity? And four answers are given. Work done, time, temperature, and displacement. You know, work is a scalar quantity. Time is a scalar quantity, which has no direction. Temperature also a scalar quantity. So the vector quantity is displacement. So for the answer for the first question is D. Second question, which of the following is equivalent to one kilowatt hour? Okay, so one kilowatt hour means the question number two. Kilowatt hour. What is it? One kilowatt hour. That means you know kilowatt is the unit of Power. Watts is the unit of power. Kilowatt is 1000 watts. Is multiplied by 1 hour. Hour is the unit of time. That is, you know how to convert hour to second. So that means here the, hour, the unit of power is multiplied by unit of time. So unit of power in the unit of time gives the unit of energy. But we'll convert this to SI unit. So 1 kilowatt hour means, kilowatt means 1000 watts into one hour one hour means 60 times 60 you know converting hour to second 60 times 60 seconds that's going to be thousand times 60 times 60 watts into second what means joule per second so joule per second into second is joules okay solve it the answer will be 3.6 into 10 to the power 6 joules 3.6 10 to the power 6 joules so the correct answer is C okay question number 3 about Stokes law you know see Stokes law tells about the uh, viscous drag acting on our sphere when it moves uh, when a sphere moves in a fluid uh, and it should be uh, the fluid motion around the sphere must be uh, laminar flow. So the condition to use Stokes law, there are two different conditions. One is it should be a spherical shape object. The second condition, uh, the fluid flow around the sphere must be laminar flow. And we know the equation for the Stokes law, F equal 6 pi eta rv. And we know that when the speed increases, drag force will increase. Similarly, when the radius increases also, drag force will increase. When the drag force increases, the laminar flow will become turbulent flow around the fluid. So when it becomes turbulent flow, we can't use the Stokes law. It will become invalid. So the condition, the fluid flow around the sphere should be laminar. That means the drag force around the sphere should be reasonably smaller. Right. So here in this question, they are giving four different statements. The first statement, large sphere moving quickly through a fluid. Large sphere means radius will be larger. Moving quickly means speed will be larger. So the drag force will be larger. So most probably there's a chance the fluid flow around the sphere uh, could be turbulent. So we can't use the Stokes law there. Second statement, B. A large sphere moving slowly through a fluid. Okay, so anyway, we don't know the numerical values, but large sphere means R is larger. That also can cause the drag force larger. So it could become a uh, turbulent flow. So they are also better. We can't use the uh, equation. The Stokes law cannot be used. Third one, small sphere. Okay, the radius becomes smaller quickly through the fluid, moves quickly through the fluid. So there also a small sphere, but speed is larger. We don't know the numerical value, but if the speed becomes larger, that can make the drag force larger and the, uh, the uh, drag force will become larger means it could be a turbulent flow. So it should be a laminar flow if I want to use the equation. So better the suitable condition, smaller sphere, lower speed, Answer D, a small sphere moving slowly through a fluid. So the suitable answer for question number three is D. Okay, so question number four. 
Okay, so for fourth question, this diagram is given and someone is pushing. There's a person, someone is pushing, but the person is drawn there. Okay, so someone is pushing a box on a uh, in, on an inclined plane. So we assume there is no friction, right? The weight is given as 200 Newton. The force applied by the person is 90 Newton. The question is, which of the following expressions could be used to determine the efficiency of the ram? So someone is pushing it along the ram by applying a force of 90 Newton. So when it moves along the ram 10 meters, the height it moved is 4 meters. Efficiency of the ram, they are asking. Okay, so efficiency of the ram is means the ram is used to raise the object to a height of 4 meters. So the person is applying a, a new force of 90 Newton and he is moving it along the ram a distance of 10 meters. So he is doing work. So when he does work of 90 into 10, that's a work done by the person, that's the input work, right? So when he does a work of 90, force into distance moved along the direction of force, that is 90 into 10. When he does that work, the amount of gain in gravitational potential energy is going to be 4 meters. The amount of gravitational potential energy is due to the 4 meters so we can say the useful output work means that is the gain in gravitational potential. So when the object moves up, the purpose of the ramp to raise the object through a vertical height of 4 meters. So there it's gaining a gravitational potential energy of mgh. So mg is 200. That's the weight. Mg is 200. That is the weight of the object. Into height is 4 meters. That's the useful output work. So the input energy or input work, input energy that is given by the person, that is he is applying a force of 90 Newton, work done. Input energy is the work done by the person. Work done by the person is force applied by him and the distance it moved. We know the efficiency is given by useful output work that is 200 times 4 divided by the input energy 90 times 10 into 100 percent. Okay, so the answer is not given in percentage, so we can remove the percentage. So if I give it in fraction, that's going to be 200 times 4 into 90 times 10. Are there any answers? Yes, answer C. The correct answer is C. Okay, question 5 is uh, related to the properties of Newton's third law pair of forces. You know, when uh, a force is exerted on, by object A on object B, the object B will exert the same magnitude of force on A in opposite directions. Those two forces are called Newton's third law pair of forces. So those Newton's third law pair of forces have some properties. They should have the same magnitude, first property. They should act on two different objects, second property. They should act in opposite direction to each other third property they should be the same type of forces they should act for the same time right so when we consider the which of the following statements is not a correct description of these forces so we know that you should remember those properties so the forces act at the same time is a correct statement so the statement is correct but we want a wrong statement right so that is not the answer answer B, the forces act in the same direction is the wrong thing. They act always, the Newton's third law pairs, always act in opposite direction to each other. So that is a wrong statement. We want a wrong statement. That should be the answer. The question is, which is not correct statement. So question number five, the correct answer is B. Right, question number six, a ball is thrown vertically upwards. Which of the table correctly describes the magnitude of the initial acceleration of the ball and the magnitude of the acceleration when it is uh, at its maximum height? So the initial acceleration might give confusion to students because it does not mean the time at which it was 
thrown that means immediately after it is thrown right when it is not con uh, in contact with the hand or whatever it is immediately after it leaves the hand that is the thing they called as uh, initial acceleration acceleration at the maximum height so there's a table given now you should know that when object is thrown uh, vertically and when we neglect the drag force always wherever the object whether it is just left the hand or whether it is on the way to the highest point or whether it is at the highest point or whether it is coming down whatever the position it will have a force that is the weight acting downwards so that means if i use f equal ma that is always downwards if i use that is mg equal ma M, M will get cancelled, so A equal G. The acceleration will be always downwards, which is equal to the gravitational acceleration. So, if the direction of velocity is upwards when you throw it, at that moment, immediately after you throw and on the way when it is moving upward direction, the direction of velocity is upwards, the direction of acceleration is downwards, right? So you should know that whenever the direction of acceleration is opposite to the direction of velocity, it will decelerate. That's the reason when you throw an object uh, under gravity and if there's no drag force, what happens when it moves upward direction, it will decelerate the reason the direction of velocity and the direction of acceleration are opposite to each other but the acceleration will be downwards when it is at the highest point also the velocity will become equal to zero but the force is still lacking the weight is still lacking so it will have the acceleration downwards even at the highest point when it comes down during the motion when it comes down when it falls down, the direction of velocity is down, the force also downwards, the acceleration also downwards. That means direction of velocity and the direction of acceleration are the same. So the object will accelerate. That means the velocity will increase. But remember that wherever the object stays, whether it's on the way to the highest point or at the highest point or when it is falling down, whatever the uh, positions, it will have the weight downwards and because of the weight there will be acceleration downwards right so the answer is initial acceleration is 9.81 meter per second squared that is downwards they are not telling anything about the direction so the initial acceleration is 9.81 meter per second squared acceleration at maximum height that also 9.81 meter per second squared so the correct answer for question number six is c question number six correct answer c okay question number seven one end of a 50 centimeter length of wire is attached to a support a load is attached to the free end of the wire so it will extend certainly which extends by two millimeter that's the extension which of the following is the strain for the length of the wire you know that strain is defined as extension over initial length or extension over original length so that is not a big issue question number seven so the strain is delta x over x x is the initial length delta x is the extension so the extension is two millimeters so two into 10 to the power minus 3 divided by the initial length which is 50 centimeter 50 into 10 to the power minus 2 solve it you will get 0 0.004 which has no unit so the correct answer a Okay, question number eight is uh, related to a graph. Uh, that means they are giving four different graphs. A ball is dropped, bounces once, and it's then caught. Which of the following graphs of gravitational potential energy? So y-axis is gravitational potential energy, and the x-axis is time. So which of the four graphs is correct? Okay, so gravitational potential energy is mgh, right? So h is the height from the ground. So the ball, if I take this is the ground, this is the ball, initially it was at a height h. So it's dropped, when it moves down, the height will decrease. So the gravitational potential energy is given by mgh 
So the height is decreasing, so the gravitational potential energy should decrease. Right, so either this graph or this graph because gravitational potential energy should decrease when the balls moves down. So the gravitational potential energy decreases due to decrease in edge. But the question is how the gravitational potential energy varies with time. So I should think about how the height varies with time. So it's like height time graph, height time graph. Or I can say this is a displacement time graph where the ground is taken as the reference point. If I take the ground as a reference point, that is the height. So if I think about height time graph and if I multiply by that mg, that will become gravitational potential energy time graph. So we know that when it falls down, the height will decrease, right? That means the displacement from the ground will decrease and the rate of decrease will increase because it's falling under gravity. So rate of decrease will increase because it's falling under gravity and it's accelerating. So the graph, the gradient should increase. It cannot be a constant gradient. So when it comes to these two graphs, the gradient should increase. So here you can see the gradient is increasing. The slope of the graph is increasing. Is it when I think about the curve like this, the slope is increasing. So height is the rate of decrease in height is increasing. So the rate of decrease in gravitational potential energy will increase after hitting the ground, the ball is moving up. So the height time graph when I consider, the rate of increase of height will decrease because the ball is going to decelerate because of the gravitational force. So the slope of the graph should decrease when it moves up. So slope of the graph when I consider height time graph, the rate of increase of height should decrease so the rate of increase of gravitational potential energy also should decrease. So the correct graph is A. So question number eight, the correct answer is A. Okay, question number 10 is, you know, there are two different stiffnesses we study in uh, material, solid materials. One is about young modulus. Other one is the K, F people K delta X. When we consider Hooke's law, F people K delta X, where K is the Hooke's law constant, and we call it as stiffness of the given object. K indicates the stiffness of the given elastic material, whether if it is a spring or wire, whatever it is, it's the K indicates the stiffness of the given object. K is the, uh, we call Hooke's law constant. The next one is also called stiffness, but that is the stiffness of the material that is young modulus. Young modulus equal tensile stress over tensile strain. That gives the stiffness of the given material. Both indicates the stiffness. K and young modulus both indicates the stiffness, but the meaning is different. This is the stiffness of the given object. So that depends on the dimension of the given object. But this is the stiffness. The young modulus indicates the stiffness of the material. It does not depend on the dimension of the object when you consider, or it depends only on the type of material. So the question, they are giving it on a table format. Stiffness uh, constant applies to, stiffness constant applies to, the other one is young modulus applies to. So stiffness constant means they refer it as K actually. So it is actually suitable for object. K depends on the material as well as the dimension. So it's suitable for the given object. The other one, young modulus depends only on the material and it does not depend on the dimension. So correct answer is the stiffness constant applies to objects. This one, this applies to material, but this depends on the material also. But for the given object, we normally say because K depends on the dimension also, but this depends only on the type of the material, not depending on the uh, dimension. So answer D, the correct answer is D. Okay, question number 10, the last MCQ question. They are, they are given two different diagrams. Uh, one, uh, these are the weighing scales, right? So a material, which uh, a, a cube, right? A cube shaped material is kept on it and it weighs 50 grams. So the length of one side of the cube is X. 
This is another type of material which length is 1.5x, it's a cube, and that also reads uh, uh, 50 grams. In both, the reading is 50 grams. So the question is, the student also measured the mass of larger cube with sides of 1.5x, so that also 50 grams. And which of the following is the density rho L of the large cube? So the density of this one is said rho L. The density of this one is rho L and this is given as rho S. So they ask you to find rho L in terms of rho S. Right. So I can say density equal mass over volume. So rho S is equal to mass, I can say 50 over the volume X cube. Here, the rho L is equal to same mass 50 over 1.5 X holding cube. Right. So I need to replace this in terms of this. So this I can write uh, 1 over 1.5 cube times 50 over X cube. Is it when I take the index inside, it will become 1.5 cube. 1 over into 50 over x cube. But instead of 50 over x cube, I can substitute rho s. So it's going to be 1 over 1.5 cube times rho s. So the question is, they ask me to find the value of uh, rho l in terms of rho s. Solve this 1 over 1.5 cube. Do it by using calculator. You will get 0 0.30, 0 0.30 rho s. So the rho l is equal to 0 0.30 rho s. So the answer is correct answer D, the question number 10. Okay, question number 14, the above, sorry, question number 11, the above graph is given. The graph shows how the velocity of an object varies with time. So I showed the values at 9 seconds, the velocity is 14 meter per second. At 12 seconds, the velocity becomes zero. Then it's a straight line. So this is a straight line. But the question is, describe how the acceleration of the object varies with time. You know the gradient of the velocity time graph gives the acceleration. Your answer should include the calculation. So I can say the whole part of the graph is straight line. So during the first nine seconds, it's a straight line, so the acceleration is remaining constant. Then, during nine to 12 seconds, again, the object is having a constant acceleration, but actually we say it's decelerating uniformly because the velocity is decreasing and the graph is a straight line. So I can calculate the gradient of this line, zero to nine seconds, I can calculate. So I can call that as A1 is equal to 14 minus zero over nine minus zero, that will be equal to uh, 1.56 meter per second squared. Then I can calculate the acceleration during 9 to 12 seconds. This is 0 to 9 seconds. 0 to 9 seconds I found it. Now 9 to 12 seconds if I calculate the acceleration again I should find the gradient that should be 0 minus 14 divided by 12 minus 9. So that will be minus 4.67 meter per second squared. That is during 9 to 12 seconds. Now, since this is the same straight line, the gradient of this portion, that is up to 17.5 seconds. If you see the graph, this is almost 17.5 seconds. Whatever it is, even this part will have the same gradient as this one because it's the same straight line. But you can see now the velocity is increasing during 12 to 17.5 seconds, the velocity, the magnitude is increasing, but it is going to be on negative side. You can see it's becoming minus 30 here. Velocity is increasing in opposite direction, is it? So I can say, the final answer I can say, during first nine seconds, the object is uniformly accelerating and its acceleration is 1.56 meter per second squared. During the first nine seconds the object is uniformly accelerating and the acceleration is 1.56 meter per second squared 
During 9 seconds to 12 seconds, the object is uniformly decelerating and its deceleration, when we say deceleration, we don't say negative sign. I can say its deceleration is 4.67 meter per second square during the time interval 9 to 12 seconds. Then it comes to rest at 12 seconds, but that is not the question because they ask me to uh, describe the acceleration. Then during 12 seconds to 17.5 seconds or beyond 12 seconds, the velocity is increasing. That means the object is accelerating in opposite direction to earlier direction and the magnitude of the acceleration again is equal to 4.67 meter per second square. That should be the answer for question 40. It's accelerating uniformly at 1.56 meter per second square during 0 to 9 seconds. 9 to 12 seconds, it's uniformly decelerating at 4.67 meter per second square. Beyond 12 seconds, the object is accelerating in opposite direction to earlier direction and the magnitude of the acceleration is 4.67 meter per second square. That's the answer for question number 11. Okay, question number 12 is nothing. It's something IGCSE standard question. A student wants to find the gravitational acceleration. So he is using a light gate connected to the timer and a wooden rod is dropped and he is going to measure the interruption time. Okay, so the student carries out an experiment to determine a value for G, the acceleration of free fall. A short wooden rod is released above the light gate, the timer connected to the light gate. The student uses the equation V squared equal U squared plus 2A. So they are giving the equation and U is zero, the rod is dropped from rest. State the additional measurements the student should take. So, you know, we can find, if I know the length of the rod, Right, so compared with measuring the acceleration of a trolley by using light, if we attach an interruption card, so we should know the width of the card, and when it passes through the light gate, uh, there will be interruption time that will be recorded by the timer. So the velocity at that point is equal to width of the card divided by the uh, interruption time is it we learned that in uh, IGCS in the same way instead of using a card here the length of the rod so when the rod passes through the light gate it's going to block the light so the length of the rod if I know the length of the rod if I know that is L I can find the velocity by using length of the rod divided by the interruption time so they are asking to find the additional information so if i want to find the acceleration i should know the velocity of the rod at this position to find it i should know the length of the rod and he is using this radical u squared plus 2as to find the acceleration to as right so i know the v i can find it from here l over t all this square u is given zero the rod is dropped from rest so i should find the a that is the gravitational acceleration so i need this s the height it falls down so i should know the height of the rod above the light gate so the two measurements i need are the height of the rod or the distance falling by the rod from the initial position to the light gate then i should know one answer the second answer length of the rod okay second question describe how the velocity v of the wooden rod as it passes through the light gate can be determined accurately okay i already told that if i know the interruption time which is recorded by the timer and if i know the length of the rod so i can find the velocity of the rod when it passes through the light gate is given by length of the rod. So length of the rod divided by the interruption time. I can say time recorded by the light gate, time recorded by the light gate or time of interruption. Okay, so for a given height, Second mark they are giving for, uh, the same, this is one mark, second mark to make the velocity accurate at a, for a particular height of drop, I should repeat the experiment and find the average velocity or I can repeat the experiment, find the average time 
and divide the length of the rod by the average time. Either way, I can do to uh, improve the reading of the velocity. So this is for the second part. C part. So I answered this is B part. Sorry, this is B part. A part I already answered. That is the two measurements. One is length of the rod and the other one is the initial height. This is the B part. Uh, second mark, I should say repeat the experiment and find the average time. That should be written for the B part. Second mark. Now part C. Describe how the student can determine a value for G using a graphical method. Okay, so you can say like this. Okay, so these are the steps I wrote it on the board. So these are the steps for the part C. They are asking to describe how the student can determine a value for G using a graphical method. Three marks. Okay, you can say measure the initial height edge, find its velocity V, vary the height H, and find the corresponding velocity V. So every time you vary and find the corresponding velocity of the wooden rod. Then use the equation U is zero. A is the G, S is the height equivalent, so that is H. So plot a graph of V e square. So you know V and H are the variables. This is the uh, independent variable. This is the dependent variable. Normally we draw a dependent variable on the Y axis and the independent variable on the X axis. So plot a graph of V squared against H, you will get a straight line. Y equal to MX format. So the relationship, you will get a straight line from the graph. So find the gradient that will be 2G. The gradient will be equal to 2G. So divide the gradient by 2. You will get uh, the gravitational acceleration or acceleration of free fall. Okay, question number 13. So there are two brackets A and B support a shelf of length 1.2 meter. That's shown there. Bracket A is positioned 0.15 meters from left hand so that is 0.15 this is 0.35 there's a book and the distance of b from this end i can name these ends p and q this end i can call p this as q so the distance of b from a uh, p is the question but they are saying the normal contact forces of each bracket on the shelf are equal so the normal reaction force i can call this r this also are the normal reaction forces. Both are same. They are saying both have the same value, right? So the weight of the book is given 8.5 Newton and the book is at rest. So the book is going to push, exert push on the weighing scale. So the push exerted by the book on the weighing scale will be equal to 8.5 Newton. So I can think about the force exerted by the book. That's the push by the book on the weighing scale. That is the, uh, on the... Uh, Sorry, not weighing scale on the uh, shelf that is going to be 8.5 newton and weight of the shelf is given 14 newton but they did not mention it as a uniform shelf you can see that none of the place it's mentioned so they are not telling it's as a uniform uh, shelf but we'll take it as uniform so it lacked at the center that is 1.6 meter from p at that point the weight is acting so that is uh, 14 newton okay so i need to find r the the force exerted by the distance of b from p i need to find the d okay so i can say since the system is at rest right if i consider upward direction r plus r minus 8.5 minus 14 equal to 0. So from this I can find the value of r. So 2r is equal to take it to the right side that is 22.5 newton. So I can find the r that will be 11.25 newton. Right. So I found the normal reaction exerted by a or b. Both have the same magnitude. Now I need to find the distance d. So take moment about P, so take moment about P, if I consider the moment in clockwise direction as positive, so 0 0.15 into this R, that is 11.25, this one anti-clockwise, well, this is, uh, I'm taking anti-clockwise positive, so this is going to be clockwise direction, so it's going to be minus 
8.5 in this distance 0 0.35 this also clockwise so that's going to be minus 14 into distance is the total length is 1.2 i took it as it's a uniform uh, shelf so the weight will act at the center so 0 0.6 that's the distance of the center of mass of the shelf from p 0 0.6 then plus that is going to give anti-clockwise motion again r into d i know the r 11.25 so 11.25 into d equal to zero because according to the principle of moment right and solve it and find the d you will get d is equal to 0 0.86 meter Okay, B part, bracket B is moved closer to the left hand end of the shelf. So that is they are moving the B towards P, towards P, the towards left side, right? Explain the effect on the magnitude of the normal contact force of bracket B on the shelf. Okay, now look at here. Okay, so even if it is moved towards left, the total upward force will be equal to total downward force so the values will become different now here first part they said both have the same normal reaction now it's going to be different i can call r1 and r2 but always even if you move b to the left i can say r1 plus r2 the total upward force must be equal to total downward force that is 8.5 plus 14 so there's no change only the values will change among them when you change the position, but the sum of the upward force will be equal to sum of the downward force. That will remain constant. Right. So the question is, what will happen to the R2? So for that, better we should reduce the unknown. So we'll think about moment about A. Consider moment about A. The turning effect, the moment about A when I consider. So you take moment, consider moment about A. So there the total clockwise moment must be equal to total anti-clockwise moment. So which forces are going to clockwise moment? 8.5 and 14, both of them will give clockwise moment about A. There is no moment for R1 about A because R1 is passing through A. It has no distance from A. So R1 has no moment about A. So the total clockwise moment will be due to 14 Newton and 8.5. So I can say the total clockwise moment will be 8.5. So consider moment about A. So total clockwise moment will be 8.5 into the distance 0 0.35 plus 14 times 0 0.6. This is the total clockwise moment. This will give the total clockwise moment since the shelf is at rest, it must be equal to total anti-clockwise moment. Now, when I consider moment about A, the anti-clockwise moment is only by R2. There is no other force because it has no moment about A. So, the anti-clockwise moment about R2 will be R2 times the distance of B from A, let it be D1. So, now what's happening? Total clockwise moment should be equal to total anti-clockwise moment because shelf is at rest. I am considering about point A in the moment. When D decreases, the distance of B from A, that is when D1 decreases, what will happen? The total clockwise moment will remain unchanged. There is no change in these values. But D1 is decreasing when it is moving towards A. So R2 should increase is it because this is constant no change this is decreasing so r2 should increase so that's answer just two mass you can see the total clockwise moment should be equal to total anti-clockwise moment about a since the shelf is at rest then you can see the total clockwise moment is given by 8.5 newton and 14 newton that has no change so total clockwise moment will remain unchanged therefore the total anti-clockwise moment is given only by R2 and when the distance of B from A decreases, 
R2 will increase. That's the answer for B part, question number 13. The value of R2, that is the normal reaction by B, will increase. Okay, so this is the question 14. It's completely explaining type question. So they are, they are saying uh, uh, when egg is kept in water, uh, one day egg is kept in water, it will submerge, immersed into the water. And after one month, it will float like that, right? So this is something related to Archimedes principle also. And uh, there are two statements given. So this is the egg, there is a uh, cell inside the egg. So they are saying the statement one says old eggs, that is uh, one month uh, later, old eggs float because as the egg ages, it starts to decompose. As it decomposes, gases are produced that escape through the egg shell. So anyway, so that means something is going out of the egg, means the total weight of the egg will decrease, is it? Statement 2 says, as the egg ages, air enters into the egg through the egg shell and increases the size of air cell. So, increases the size of air cell means it might become larger, the volume of the air cell. The larger air cell act as a flotation device and hence hold eggs float. So, something is entering inside. That's what statement 2 says, as the egg ages, air enters the egg means it's going to be larger weight. Okay, so anyway, now if I think about day one, and if I think about the free body force diagram for day one, what are the forces acting on it? It has the weight downwards. There will be uppers from the water, and there will be normal reaction from the contact point. So the, I can say, I can call it as R1 uppers as U1. I can say U1 plus R1 should be equal to Mg. R, so R1 plus U1, if I think about Archimedes principle, U1 is equal to volume of the displaced water, that is the volume of the egg, volume of the displaced water, that is equal to volume of the egg, that I can call V1, density of water into G is equal to Mg. This is the weight of the displaced water. V1 is the volume of the displaced water. That should be same as volume of the egg because egg is completely inside water. Right, now think this is at one day, right? Now when it ages, what happens? It comes to this position. If I think about this position, there are, if I think about that position, what are the forces? There are the up plus U2 and the weight Mg. So there U2 is equal to Mg, right? So imagine I put an egg in the water and I left it for one month, it has come up. So the equation should change from this to this after one month. This is after one month, one month old of egg, right? So this equation should come to this one. Okay, if I think about the second statement first. So if I think about the second statement, so when I put egg, which is one day old, it went down and touches the base of the container. So this equation will be satisfied at that moment. So if this equation is satisfied, and if I think about the statement two, they are saying air is entering as the egg ages, air enters to, into the egg means the weight should increase. So the right hand side should increase. So if the right hand side increases and in both statements, remember, they are not telling anything about the change in volume of the egg. So we should assume the volume remains constant, right? So volume of the egg is not changing. Only the, they are telling about the air shell volume is increasing, but the total volume is not changing. So the upthrust will not change because that depends on the volume of the weight of the displaced water. That depends on the volume of the displaced water. That is the way, uh, volume of the egg right so here nothing mentioned about the volume of the egg means we should assume it is not changing okay so if i think about the statement two the weight is increasing right so when the weight increases right side the left side also should increase so left side increases means there's no chance for r1 to become zero so it will remain inside the water touching the base of the container so certainly the statement two is wrong Right. How the statement one can I say it's correct? Now look at here. According to statement one, what's happening? 
AI is going out of tech means the weight is decreasing. So right hand side is decreasing gradually. So when the right hand side decreases and no change in volume of the egg, right? That is the volume of the egg when it is complete inside. That is V1. No change in volume of the egg, but Mg is decreasing because AI is gradually going out when it ages the egg. Okay, no change in V1, no change in rho, no change in G, but Mg is decreasing according to statement 1. So, Mg decreases, R1 will gradually decrease and there's a possibility for a particular Mg, R1 will become equal to 0, right? So, when R1 becomes equal to 0, we will have a position like V1 rho Wg equal Mg. So, I can imagine that as inside water, the egg will be somewhere here, something like this. It will be somewhere here, right? But it's not touching the base. Now, if the Mg decreases further, when the age is further, when the Mg decreases further, rho W can't decrease, G can't decrease, V1, that is the volume of the displaced water. Now, the egg is completely inside, so that is equal to volume of the egg. Now, when Mg decreases, what will happen? The egg will shift up such that it's going to displace smaller volume of water. So now it's going to be this volume. This volume. So when Mg decreases further, V1 also will decrease and there's a chance V1 can become smaller than volume of the egg. The volume of the displaced water, when it becomes smaller than the volume of the egg, the egg will partially float inside water like this after one month. So, the statement 2 is the correct one. So, according to statement 2, what's happening? When it ages, when it ages, weight decreases. When weight decreases, gradually R1 will decrease. And there's a time R1 will become equal to 0. So, at that time, V1 is the volume of the displaced water that is equal to volume of the egg. So, it will be at a position like this. It's completely inside the water, but not touching the base. But when Mg decreases further, what will happen? The volume of the displaced water will decrease. So, V1 is the volume of the displaced water. So, there will be a position. It will become V2. That's the volume of the displaced water times density of water into G equal to Mg. Now, this M1, I can call this as M1G or M2G, which is smaller than the initial weight. So, V2 is the volume, which is the displaced water. Volume of the displaced water, V2 smaller than V1 means this I can call the shaded portion is V2, V2 smaller than V1. So, it will partially out of the water. So, statement 2 is the correct one. Right, so I gave the full answer for this question. So, I can say statement 2 is not correct since when air enters the egg its weight will increase and never moves up so the egg will not move up so according to statement 1 when air escapes from the egg its weight will decrease i already explained all so the total upward force that is u plus r also will decrease because u plus r is equal to mg i can say u plus r you can draw a small diagram like this on the answer so u plus r will be equal to m1g but when Mg decreases further, what happens? R will become equal to 0 and when uh, but 0 and the egg will not touch the base of the bowl. So, R0 means no contact with the bottom of the bowl. Now, if the weight decreases further, the only thing later you have to decrease further when the Mg decreases. So, that means rho W and G will not change. Only thing V, the volume of the displaced water should decrease. That means it should come out of the water so they will partially float after one month when it gets caged so statement one is the correct one i think this is correct yeah this is okay question 15 is something related to momentum but actually First part is vector diagram. So, 
there are two balls p and q identical balls they are given their momentum q was at rest initially momentum of p initially we don't know but after collision we know the momentum of p that is this direction momentum of p this direction 0 0.096 kilogram meter per second it makes an angle of 10 15 degree with horizontal direction that's the initial direction of p the velocity of q is this direction the momentum of q is this direction this is p this is q its momentum is 0 0.14 kilogram meter per second that is uh, 10 degree with horizontal line and we need to draw a vector diagram. So if I add these two vectors by using vector addition rule, I will get the final total momentum. That's the question. Find use the vector diagram to show that the magnitude of the total momentum. So just we can draw the vector diagrams by using vector addition rule. The thing is uh, the values are a bit confusing, difficult to find a common value, say when you are dividing, uh, when you are defining a scale for vector diagram, it's bit difficult. But I can say like this: if I say uh, this one, now when you consider these two things, how many times of this one compared to this one? That will be if you divide 0 0.14 by 0 0.096, it will become almost 1.458. So almost, I can say 1. Four five times. This is one point four five times of this one. So, if I show this by five centimeter, this will be five into one point four five. I can call this as six centimeter. I can see a scale zero point zero nine six kilogram meter per second. I'm going to show by six centimeter. So this will be zero point one four. 0 0.14 uh, kilogram meter per second will be six times. The ratio between them is 1.45, 1.45 centimeter. So that will be almost 8.75, or I can say 8.8 .8 centimeter. Not accurate, but we can do like that. Okay, so now I can draw a vector diagram so with horizontal line draw this one first so i can either one you can draw first so if i draw this one if you are take the lowest part of the graph paper the given grid on this grid so take from here or somewhere you can say at lowest point measure 15 degree and draw this one 0 0.096 so 6 centimeter at 15 degree 6 centimeter then from that if we extend this one and take from here 25 degrees so if i take draw both here it's going to be 25 degree 15 plus 10 so measure from here 25 degree and draw 8.8 .8 centimeter it will come to the same horizontal line it will come to the horizontal line. So this is the total vector, the total momentum. Measure this length, you will get the answer. And use this scale to convert the value. You will get the velocity, sorry, the total momentum. This one will be almost 0 0.21 kilogram meter per second, something like that, you will get it, okay? So on the board, I can't draw. But you draw this way, you will get 0 0.21 kilogram meter per second for this moment. And you will get a particular length here. Use that length to convert to get the unit of kilogram meter per second. That will be 0 0.21 kilogram meter per second. Okay, so B part state the principle of conservation of momentum. So you can say when there are no external force such as friction. Initial total momentum will be equal to final total momentum. You had it in IGCSE also. Right, part C, calculate the initial velocity of sphere P. So you can see that initially the sphere Q is at rest, sphere P is moving. So the initial total momentum is also the same. 
according to the law of conservation of momentum, we found the final total momentum that is 0 0.21 kilogram meter per second. So, according to the law of conservation of momentum, the initial total momentum also 0 0.21 kilogram meter per second, but initially Q is at rest that has no momentum. So, the momentum of P is also the same 0 0.21 kilogram meter per second. We ask them to find the initial velocity of P. So, this is the final total momentum that should be the initial total momentum and that is the initial momentum of P because Q was at rest. So, this is equal to momentum of P that means mass of P into velocity of P. Mass of P is given 0 0.12 kilogram into Pp. Find the Pp 0 0.21 divided by 0 0.12 and you will get 1.75 almost 1.75 meter per second. That's the velocity of P before collision. Okay, so it's an interesting question uh, about uh, in 2016, the European Space Agency sent the probe to Mars as the probe approached the surface of Mars with a vertical velocity, vertical compound of velocity, 460 meter per second. So there is a parachute. The parachute was opened to reduce the speed of the probe. Once the vertical velocity of the probe had reduced to 75 meter per second, so you know there is atmosphere, so it's dropping to 75 meter per second, uh, the parachute is removed. So then there's a small motion which reduces the speed further to 68 meter per second. And due to some default, due to some error, the thrust wall switched off too soon. So they are removing the parachute and here they are opening the uh, they are starting the thrust right to reduce the speed further it becomes 68 but here the thrust goes wrong something uh, mistake so it's falling under gravity and just before hitting the ground its velocity is 150 meter per second the parachute was used over a distance of 9.7 kilometers so the distance fallen from this position to this position is given as 9.7 kilometers. First part show that the average vertical deceleration of the probe due to the parachute was about 11 meter per second square. So deceleration. So a part, first part, I can use e square equal u square plus 2as for the motion from here to here, right? So the final velocity is 75, so 75 square. The initial velocity is 460, 460 square plus two times, eight times. The distance falling is 9.7 kilometers, so 9.7 into 1,000. So find the A, you will get negative 10.62 meter per second square. So that means negative, that means it's slowing down, is it? So the deceleration is is equal to 10.62 meter per second squared, approximately 11 meter per second squared. Right. Next part, the parachute was at an angle to the vertical as shown here. So they are giving a diagram. So there the parachute was given. This is the the probe and this is the vertical line and the parachute was the axis of the parachute was shown at 6 degree to the vertical so the total resistive force acting on the parachute and the probe was at an average angle of 6 degree to the vertical so here is the drag force the resistive force is there which is at 6 degree to the vertical line Calculate the magnitude of the average total resistive force. You may neglect the mass of the parachute. So the parachute cloth, that mass we can neglect. Mass of the probe is 600 kilograms. So the weight of the probe is 600 times G, mg. G is given 3.8 in mass, 3.8. So that's the weight of the probe. Okay, so we know its acceleration in vertical direction is six, uh, 10.62 meter per second square. That's a deceleration. So I need to find 
the FR, the total resistive force. So I should use second part. I know it's decelerating. So downwards use F equal MA. So downward total force will be, it's decelerating 600 into 3.8. That is MG. So I'll write it as first MG. So the total downward force is MG minus FR cos 6 equal M times A is deceleration. So I should substitute the deceleration. So it should be a negative value. So MG that is 600 into 3.8 minus FR cos 6 equal M is 600 into A is the deceleration. So minus 10.62. Solve it and find the FR. You will get FR will be equal to 8690 almost. It will be 8690 Newton. If you give it in feet significant figures you can say 8700 it's okay so it's 8699 so it has 1700 yeah if you use 10.6 it will be 8690 6 to 10 uh, you will get 8700 yeah okay we part the propose in free fall from height of 3.7 meter uh, sorry, 3.7 kilometer reaching the surface of Mars with a velocity of 150 meter per second. So that means this is 3.7 meter, 3.7 kilometers rainfall. Right? Explain whether the term free fall is correct in this context. Your answer should include a calculation and the gravitational field strength of mass is given 3.8 Newton per kilogram. Okay, you can answer in two different ways. First, you must say what is meant by free fall. Free fall means the only force acting on the probe is its weight. You must tell that to get first mark. Okay, so you can say first mark. The only force acting on the probe is weight, then it will be at free fall, right? So by using that, we will check whether is it actually at a free fall. So if we think that way, okay, if the only force acting on it is the weight, then what will happen? So if this is the probe and it has the only force acting is the weight, no drag force, nothing then it will be under free fall. So the acceleration will be equal to the gravitational acceleration that should be equal to 3.8 meter per second squared. So we will use the equation V squared equal U squared plus 2As for the motion from this position to this position when it falls through 3.7 kilometer, we will find its acceleration and check whether that acceleration A is equal to the gravitational field strength right so we can use that first you must tell that if it is under free fall the only force acting on it is the weight that you must tell first then we can use the equation v squared equal u squared plus 2as first method the final velocity will say 150 meter per second just before hitting the ground initial velocity when it starts its motion under gravity the free fall it is 68 meter per second so 68 squared plus 2 times A times S is 3.7 kilometers, so 8,000. Find the A. When you find the A, you will get 2.42 meter per second squared. So you can see that that is smaller than the gravitational field strength or acceleration of free fall is given as on the surface of Mars 3.8 meter per second squared. That means it is not at free fall because acceleration is smaller than the acceleration of free fall. That is the gravitational field strength means the force acting on the object is not the weight. There should be some other force, maybe the drag force. So it is not at free fall. Right? So you can tell the statement after that. Since the acceleration of the probe is 2.4, which is less than the acceleration of free fall, that means it, there should be some other force such as drag force 
and the probe is not under phase fault. Okay, this is one method. You can find the acceleration. The second method is you can find the final velocity. Same equation I'm going to use. So I'm going to find the final velocity. So there I will take the initial velocities method to this one for the big part of question 16. So initial velocity is 68 squared. Two times, okay. If it is falling under gravity, the acceleration should be 3.8. So use 3.8 into the distance fallen is 3.7 times 1000. Find the final velocity. You will get 181 meter per second, but practically they found 150 meter per second. So the practical answer is smaller than the calculated value. So acceleration is not 3.7, that is smaller than 3.7. So there should be a drag force. You can say here also there should be a drag force. Okay, either way you can give the answer. Okay, so question 17, it's based on stress strain graph, the question based on materials. So it's about concrete, how the stress and strain varies with number of days. So for from the manufacturer, day of manufacture, after two days, the variation of stress strain is like this. 28 days, the variation like this. The first part, as the concrete dries, it's young modulus increases. You should know what is young modulus, the property of the material. How can we find the young modulus? from stress strain graph find the gradient of the linear portion of the stress strain graph okay the gradient of the linear portion of the stress strain graph gives the young modulus so show that a part question number 17 show that the value for the young modulus of the concrete after it has dried is at least 1.3 times greater so you should take the linear portion of this graph somewhere here and the linear portion of this graph somewhere here find the gradient okay so for 28 days so i can call it as this is first part of question number 17 that is a part question number 17 a part so I will call the young modulus in 28 days as E28. The notation for young modulus is E, so I will call it as E28. So from the graph, I'm going to take two different points. So that will be 60 minus 0, 60 minus 0, take it from the graph, into 10 to the power 6 because megapascal. So 10 to the power 6 divided by 0 0.0014 minus zero, find it from the graph, you will get 4.30 10 to the power 10 Pascal. Same way E2, the two days later, for that, find the gradient of the linear portion of the second graph, so that you will get 12 minus zero, 10 to the power six, divided by 0 0.00, .00 0, triple zero, 4 minus 0, so that will be 3 into 10 to the power 10 Pascal. So find E28 over E2, that will be 4.30 10 to the power 10 divided by 3 into 10 to the power 10. So that you will get almost uh, 1.43, so that is greater than 1.3. They said at least 1.3 times. So we are getting 1.43. Okay, so the next big part, you know, area covered by the stress strain graph gives the energy density. That is energy stored in the material per unit volume. That is called energy density area under the stress strain graph. Area under the force extension graph is the total energy stored in the material. So they are saying big part, page number 21, the energy absorbed before fracture by the 28 day old sample is less than the energy absorbed before fracture by two day old sample. The energy absorbed before fracture by two day sample is 0 0.35 megajoule per meter cube. 
So determine that the percentage reduction in the energy absorbed before fracture between two day old and 28 old, uh, 28 day old sample. So you need to find now the area under the two day old graph is given as 0 0.35 megajoule per meter cube before fracture. So I need to find the area under the uh, 28 day old sample. So two day old sample, the energy density is given. So the, the graph is something like this, the given graph on the paper. I need to find the area under the graph. Normally, if the graph is a curve, we find the area under the graph by using, uh, finding the, by finding the, counting the number of uh, squares. But that is more suitable if the graph is a, a curve. If it is like a, something like a curve like this, they are difficult to find the area. So we count the number of squares and we take if the graph covers more than half of a square or grid on the graph, it will be taken as one. If it is less than uh, one full square, we take it as zero and we count the number of squares. But here we don't need to do that way because the graph we can use equation because the curve is less. The graph looks a bit straight line mostly. So I thought of finding like this the area under this graph. Find the area of this triangle, right? Area of this triangle, we'll find it. The green color, what I'm shading it. Then area of the this part, trapezium. I take this as a trapezium, this as a trapezium. Area of this trapezium, we will find it. Then again, this part also looks like trapezium because these two sides are not same. So we'll find the area of this trapezium also right so we'll find one by one area of the first triangle so the total area i can see the total area under the graph this is b part of question number 17 so area is equal to first we'll find the area of this triangle that will be you know half into base into height so all the values are given i showed it you can read it from the graph so that will be half into base is 0 0.0025, 0 0.0025 into the height, it's 100 into 10 to the power 6 because it's mega, right? Now I'm going to find the area of the trapezium, which is shown by, shaded by blue color. That will be half into addition of the parallel side. So this side is 100 plus that side is 128 into 10 to the power 6 into the distance 0 0.0038 minus 0 0.0025 right now I need to find the area of the red color portion that is plus again half into Addition of the parallel side, this is 128, 128 plus this part is 124. Addition of the parallel sides into 10 to the power 6 into this small length. This is 0 0.004 minus 0 0.0038. Right. Solve this, you will get the area under the graph you will get uh, 29840 joule per meter cube right so that is the energy absorbed by 28 days old sample so the question is reduction in percentage reduction so that was 0 0.35 megajoule per meter cube given for uh, two day sample so 0 0.35 megajoule 10 to the power 6 minus 298400 divided by again 0 0.35 10 to the power 6 right the percentage reduction they ask it so if you do that you will get into 100 percentage so into 100 you will get almost 14.7 percentage.
Okay, part C. Manufacturers recommended leaving concrete blocks to dry for 28 days before use. Discuss why. So that part is yeah? so you can see the graph I earlier drew. The other graph is something like this. Below this, something like this one. Is it? So here you can see the breaking stress is more if it is 28 days. Breaking stress is less. We need larger breaking stress. Then the material, the concrete will not break even for larger stress. So what is uh, that is one advantage of having it for 28 days drying, right? So the breaking stress is larger. You can say one mark. Second one you can say the young modulus, the slope, the gradient of the slope is more for 28 days. That means it's more stiffer for 28 days dried concrete. That means it will not easily deform even for a significant amount of forces applied on it, right? So that can be stated as the second advantage. The gradient of the linear portion is more for 28 days than 22 days. So young modulus is more means stiffness is more so it will not deform easily second mark third mark you can say uh, uh, elastic limit so here can, you can see the elastic limit the linear portion the elastic limit is more for 28 days that means easily uh, even if it has a small deformation it will return to the original shape say you know during earthquake there can be tremors so you feel the vibration basic buildings but they will come back to the original shape there won't be any plastic deformation or normally concrete they don't show plastic deformation so they might crack there could be cracks formed on it so that will not happen because the elastic limit is larger for 28 days dried concrete compared to two days dried concrete so that means uh, even for there, even if there's a smaller deformation due to some force, it will return to the original shape. So these are the three advantages for 28 days dried concrete. Okay, the last question, question number 18. So it's about uh, event winter games. So they, are, they slide on a sledge, right? Uh, so the angle of the sledge is at theta. You can read the question. So they asked to draw the free body force diagram for this uh, athlete. So I can say the weight is acting vertically down, weight is larger. So they asked to consider the length of the line to indicate the force, so weight is larger. The component is smaller, the normal reaction should be perpendicular to the slope. So the it should be perpendicular to the slope, slope that is normal reaction. I can write it by words, R, right? and the friction will be along the slope upwards initially the friction will be smaller draw free body force diagram for the sledge and athlete you should consider the relative sizes normally ice the friction is smaller so you can draw friction fr or the drag force together all together the total friction and drag force the resistive force should be smaller normally right b part The mass of the athlete is one of the factors that affects her time to complete the race. Explain why the mass of the athlete has little effect on the initial acceleration. So initial acceleration means, you know, initially, uh, normally the drag force uh, depends on the speed. Greater the speed, greater the drag force. Even if you think about uh, Stokes law, the drag force F equals 6 pi eta RV that you can use only for the uh, spherical shape object when the fluid flow around it is laminar but anyway you can see the force is directly proportional to speed also force is directly proportional to the size of the sphere is it larger the size greater the drag force greater the speed greater the drag force so initially means the speed is smaller that means the athlete is starting to accelerate so the drag force will be smaller so in that situation i can neglect the drag force so if i think about the resultant force along the slope downwards that will be mg sin theta imagine why it's mg sin theta i'll draw the athlete like this this is the angle theta the weight is acting vertically downward mg this is 90 this is 90 minus theta if i think about the perpendicular line this way 
the normal reaction is acting this direction. So what would be the component of the weight along the slope? Okay, think about a line this direction. This is 90. So consider a horizontal line. I can say mg cos 90 minus theta is equal to, you know, cos 90 minus theta equal to sine theta. Or I can consider this perpendicular line where the normal reaction I found it. This is R. This is perpendicular to the slope. So this is 90 degree. This is 90 degree. This is 90 minus theta. So this angle will be the whole thing is 90. So 90 minus 90 minus theta. So that will be theta. So this angle will be equal to theta. Right? If this is theta, the angle between the normal reaction from the slope and the weight, this angle will be theta because this is 90 degree. You can see this whole thing is 90. This is 90 minus theta. So this will be 90 minus 90 minus theta is equal to theta. So if I resolve this weight mg along the slope, I should move it away from the angle theta. So the component of the weight along the slope will be mg sine theta. Right? The component of the weight along the slope will be mg sine theta because this angle is theta and resolving this mg away from the angle. So that will be away means mg sine theta. Right, so I neglect the drag force. So if I consider along the slope downwards f equal ma, so drag force is negligible because initially the speed is less, so the drag force is less. So the only force is mg sine theta equal ma. So m and m will get cancelled. So g sine theta equal a. That is acceleration along the slope down will be g sine theta that is independent of mass of the athlete. That's the question they asked initially. Explain why the mass of the athlete has little effect on the initial acceleration. So initially the acceleration does not depend on the mass. There's nothing to explain. You derive this and get it and show. Finally say since A is independent of mass, it does not depend on the mass. Okay, so B second part, B part second part. So this is the B part first part. I answer it's independent of mass. B part second part. Explain in terms of forces why the athlete reaches a maximum velocity. So maximum velocity means terminal velocity. So I told initially it does not depend on the mass. But what happens when the speed increases, I told the drag force will increase. So along the slope down, the resultant force acting on the athlete will be ma. The resultant force will be mg sine theta minus drag force fr, the resistive force equal ma. Now you can see that this resistive force depends on, or I can say proportional to, I can say almost proportional to the speed. The resistive force is proportional to speed. So what happens? When the person accelerates downward, speed will increase. When the speed increases, drag force will increase. When the drag force increases, this quantity remains constant, but this is increasing. So the total force will decrease. When the total resultant force along the slope down will decrease, right? So the acceleration will decrease. Finally, for a particular speed, the total resultant force will become equal to zero because the drag force will balance the component of the weight. So when the drag force balance the component of the weight, acceleration will become equal to zero. So no further acceleration. The athlete will move down at constant speed. That is the maximum speed called terminal speed. Okay, so I can write the answer on the board like this. Okay, so this is the answer you can write now. I hope you will understand. I already explained. So this is the answer for the second part.
So the resultant force along the slope will decrease. The reason why it decreases, this is constant, this is increasing when the speed increases. So the resultant force F will decrease, when F decreases, uh, acceleration also will decrease. But at a particular speed, FR will balance mg sine theta. So F will become equal to zero. When F become equal to zero, A will be zero. A zero means there is no further acceleration. It will move at constant speed called terminal speed. Okay, so third part, question, num uh, uh, question number 18, uh, B part, third part. It is stated that the maximum speed is greater for athletes of greater mass. Suggest why this is only correct up to a certain mass. Okay, right. Now, actually, this is like this. Now, anyway, for example, <laughs> it's like when the mass increases generally for a given type of material when the mass increases the dimension the size also will increase is it so we learned that earlier on the first part we showed that actually uh, when the mass increases the acceleration uh, downward can depend on the mass but what happens when the size, the dimension also increases, drag force also will increase. So the question is like that, the idea when the mass increases, why the, uh, the question is athlete greater mass, such as why this only correct up to a certain mass only means actually when we can general knowledge, we can say when the mass increases generally for a given density of material, the size, the dimension will increase. When the dimension, the surface area increases, drag force also will increase. So what will happen? When the drag force becomes larger, the terminal speed will become smaller. Quickly, the terminal speed, the, the drag force will balance the weight. So the compound of the weight along the slope will be Fg sine theta minus Fr is equal to the resultant force. So now, when the mass increases, yes, the drag force, if it is smaller, say if there's smaller dimension but larger mass, then we can say the resultant force is larger. But normally for a person, when the mass increases, the whole body shape can be larger. So when the body shape becomes larger, the surface area larger means the drag force will be larger. You can think about Stokes' law. The drag force is given by 6 by eta rv. So there, the larger the radius, larger the surface area. So surface area is given by 4 pi r squared. So larger radius means larger surface area means drag force is larger. That is for spherical shape object. But we can't use this for human body, for athlete. But generally we can say when the mass increases, the surface area could be most probably larger. So drag force will be larger. When the larger drag force can quickly balance the weight so the terminal speed will become smaller okay so that's the answer we should give to this part okay so we can say like this mass increases surface area also will be larger or will increase so due to larger surface area the drag force will become larger so the drag force will balance the component of the weight so we earlier told about how uh, the athlete achieves the maximum speed or the terminal speed so the compound of the weight along the slope will be quickly balanced even at lower speed so he won't be able to accelerate further so the speed won't be higher okay so c part first part they are saying that uh, this uh, after the finish line there is a straight uphill section of track for sledge to decelerate the maximum permitted gradient is 20%. Show that the track will with a gradient of 20% is at an angle of 11 degrees. So we have to show that that's nothing actually first part. That gradient means tan theta. Tan theta equal 20% means 20 over 100. Find the theta. You will get 11.3 degree. So second part. 
an athlete reaches the finish line. So he's moving from here. So he reaches the finish line. So this is the finish line. Somewhere here is the finish line. When he reaches the finish line at a speed of 33 meter per second. So here 33 meter per second. To stop him, there will be a slope with an angle 11.3 to the horizontal, right? So when he moves along this, he is exerting a resistive force of 240 Newton to stop his body. So he is going to stop somewhere here. So at this point, he is stopping because of the resistive force exerted by him. The resistive force is 240 Newton. So mass of the athlete is given as 95 kilograms. So calculate the minimum uphill length. So calculate the length, minimum length, if you want to stop uh, on the slope, which makes an angle of 11.3 degree with horizontal line. Okay, so this we can do in two different ways. One is by using Newton's laws of motion. So I'll do C part, second part, method one. So he's moving this way and decelerating. So I'm using this direction, F equal MA, along the direction of motion this way. So during that time, his mass is given 95 kilogram. The compound of the weight will act along the slope that we know that mg sine theta. I already explained the compound of the weight along the slope will be mg sine theta. So if I think about the free body force diagram for the athlete, the weight is acting along the slope down mg sine 11 degree, 11.3 degree. Also, he is exerting a resistive force to stop his body that is FR equal 240 Newton. Both forces are opposite to the direction of motion. I am using this equation along the direction of motion. So, that will be minus mg sine 11.3 minus friction that the resistive force that he exerted minus 240 is equal to ma. Right, so substitute the values. Mass is given 95 kilogram, 95 times 9.81 sine 11.3 minus 240 equal 95 times k. You will get the acceleration, the deceleration actually. You will get acceleration negative value. You will get the acceleration minus 4.45 minus 4.45. Uh, meter per second square. Okay, so use along this direction. V squared equal U squared plus 2A S. Final speed 0. He is coming to rest. So 0. Initial speed is given 33 meter per second. So 33 squared plus 2 times minus 4.45 times the distance he is going to move along the slope is L. Solve it and find the L you will get 122.4 meter, that is method 1. Method 2, I can do by using energy equations. So I can say when he is moving along the slope, he is losing his kinetic energy. Here the kinetic energy is half times mass times the 33 squared. Here the kinetic energy is zero. He has lost his kinetic energy. So according to the law of conservation energy, the kinetic energy lost by the athlete is equal to gaining gravitational potential energy. He is slowly moving up along the slope. How much is he going up? So the height is moving up along the slope. I can uh, show like this. The height he moved up will be. So this is the vertical height he is moving up when he moves from here to here. This angle we know that is 11.3 degree. So if I say the distance moved along this slope is L, H will be L sine 11.3 degree. Am I right? That's the answer. Right? So that's the height he is moving up. L sine 11.3 degree. 11, L sine. So I can say H equal L sine. 11.3 degree L sine theta, right? That's the height he is moving up. So I can say loss in kinetic energy equal to gaining gravitational potential energy, MGH, H is this much, plus work done against resistive force, is it? So I can say method 2 by using energy equation, 
लॉसिन काइनेटिक करना है जी इक्वल गेन इन ग्रेविटेशनल पोटेंशियल करना है जी ग्रेविटेशनल पोटेंशियल है जी प्लस वर्क के अगेंस्ट पैसिफिक फोर्स इज एक्सर्टिंग फोर्स टू एंड फोर्टी न्यूटन plus work done against resistive force resistive force into distance moved resistive force is along the slope so resistive force is 240 times the distance moved opposite to the resistive force is l is it work done against resistive force means resistive force into distance moved opposite to the resistive force so distance moved opposite to the resistive force is the length of the slope 240 into l Okay, so solve this equation and find that, right? If you solve this equation, you get the same answer, 122.4 meter. Okay, so I hope this is useful. We'll try to discuss other papers later.